Hi, my name is Bakul Pant and I uh, represent Ocure Energy. Ocure Energy is a developer of green hydrogen and green ammonia assets in India, Middle East and North Africa. And uh, essentially, over the longer term, we are focusing on four projects. But in the shorter term, much of our attention is consumed uh, by two projects. One project on the eastern coast of India in a state called Odisha and the other project uh, in uh, Egypt in the Suez Canal Zone. Both of these projects would involve the three components of a green ammonia facility, which would include the renewable energy portion, which includes solar and wind, uh, the electrolyzer portion, which includes the actual green hydrogen manufacturing, and also the ammonia synthesis loop and offsites. Yes, yeah, so green hydrogen is fundamentally hydrogen which has little to no carbon emissions associated with it. This is as compared to the conventional grey hydrogen, which is one of the largest producers, industrial producers of uh, carbon dioxide anywhere in the world. Now, technologically, this green hydrogen solution, which essentially comes from a, a technological innovation called the electrolyzer, has been around for the past 150 to 200 years. But commercially, uh, this whole technology was not necessarily viable. What has changed recently is the fact that the renewable energy prices, particularly in locations where the renewable resource endowment, as in solar and wind endowment, is pretty good, including countries like India, in those kind of locations, the prices of renewable electricity have come down very, very fast which basically has uh, led to a renewed interest in electrolyzers because now you can produce the uh, uh, green hydrogen, which is the product of the electrolyzer, at a lower green price premium. There is still some ground to be covered and there are uh, governmental interventions from countries like uh, governments of countries like India, Korea, US, Japan and what have you, which, is, uh, which are aimed towards stemming this residual gap, gap so that we come closer to the price of grey hydrogen or grey ammonia. So, uh, there are commitments that uh, a country like India has and there are certain aspirations that a country like India has. The commitments that uh, a country like India has is uh, essentially pegged onto its commitments as part of the Paris Accord. Uh, which are making sure that uh, the nationally determined contributions are duly complied with and perhaps even exceeded. And if they are exceeded, then it opens up the possibility of sharing the extra credits that have been generated to other countries, which may or may not be as well endowed uh, in terms of renewable energy resources and, and uh, creating some sort of a synergist synergistic mechanism. Beyond this commitment as part of global accords, there are certain aspirations which a developing country like India would have and essentially does have, which is to use this sector as uh, a lever to drive economic growth. And uh, in addition, uh, because this is fundamentally a new wave of energy transition. There have been waves of energy transition in the past, including moving from wood to coal, coal to oil. Now we're trying to move to oil to hydrogen. Uh, so this is the right time to actually make the investments and take the lead in this particular area. So the Indian central as well as state governments have worked in a fairly synergistic way to uh, kickstart the hydrogen economy in the country. The central government has come up with the so-called National Hydrogen Mission, which uh, includes multi-pronged multi uh, efforts to uh, kickstart the hydrogen economy. This includes developing and implementing a policy framework in terms of the certification of green hydrogen, safety of green hydrogen facilities, certain incentives including but not limited to the site tender, um, and then skill development and multiple other measures as well. Right? Uh, one of the uh, uh, very important policy interventions uh, uh, that the uh, central government of India has come up with is uh, ISTS as an interstate transmission of electricity waiver, char waiver of charges, which is somewhat unique to India in the sense that uh, the Indian grid is very strong, very uh, robust and you can place your uh, renewable energy portion of the facility in one part of India 
uh, preferably that part of India which is well endowed in terms of uh, solar and wind resources and take that electricity, the so-called banking and wheeling of electricity to your consumption location which would be the location where you would be setting up the green hydrogen and green ammonia facilities. So this transport charge has been made free in the transmission line and that has profound implications uh, in terms of the profitability of the project, the uh, risk mitigation of the project which uh, by corollary has implications on comparative debt financing and the viability of the project. So that's a very big, uh, uh, very important policy, supportive policy intervention that the central government has provided. In addition, uh, different states have come up with their own complementary policies uh, 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 for the green hydrogen and green ammonia business. In particular, the coastal states of India are fairly well positioned uh, to service the green ammonia demand because ammonia is the form in which you transport uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen across seas. I would say the response as the notion widely held by the stakeholders in the country and beyond the country as well has been that the response of the Indian industry has been fairly enthusiastic. There are different industrial sectors which have their own, you know, uh, kind of aspirations within this sector. There are certain large PSUs, the usual names like uh, Indian Oil Energy Sector PSUs, BPCL, HPCL, who are looking at this sector uh, to, you know, replace their current consumption of grey hydrogen with green hydrogen and they are coming up with certain projects in that particular context. Beyond that, there are fertilizer companies which produce ammonia and these include companies like National Fertilizers, Chumbal Fertilizers and what have you. And they see that as a revenue uh, making opportunity as well. Beyond that, there are steel companies who are sensing an opportunity to actually produce green steel and uh, 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 export it to markets like uh, Europe where there is a regulation coming in which would mandate the steel either to be green compliant or to be carbon to, or, or you know CBAMs, the so called CBAM credits to be bought to comply with that norm. So different companies, different sectors are coming up with their own policies. Yeah, as I touched upon earlier, uh, as part of the uh, Paris Accord, you have certain nationally defined contribution, the so-called NDCs, which have to be complied with. It's, it's sort of a mandate as long as a given country has signed up for it. Um, so then when uh, you have exceeded your commitments, then you can trade it with certain countries who need, the, need those tradable credits and that's through ITMOs and typically that that transfer mechanism happens through, uh, you know, some sort of a bilateral deal. And amongst all the countries in Asia Pacific region, I would say there are only two countries, which are two large countries, which are very well endowed, endowed with solar and wind resources, in particular solar resources, that's India and Australia. Uh, so um, a combination of good resource, renewable resource endowment, and proximity to demand markets like Korea, Japan and a couple of other countries places this region, in particular the east coast of India, very well in terms of uh, the ability to, uh, uh, you know, supply these green molecules to locations like Korea. I think that uh, India and Korea, just like many things, uh, uh, both from a cultural as well as from an industrial perspective, uh, have a lot of synergistic attributes. In this particular sect uh, sector, uh, as I touched upon a couple of times earlier, India can be positioned, because India is very well endowed in terms of renewable resources, it can produce electrons very cost competitively and it can also convert those electrons to green molecules like ammonia very, very cost competitively. And these green molecules can be transported all the way to Korea and in Korea they can be used as the derivative molecule for example ammonia molecule in and by itself it's green and clean ammonia or it could be broken down the so-called cracking of green ammonia into green hydrogen and used in certain sectors like mobility transportation in which uh, Korea in my view happens to be a world leader. 
right? So that's this flow of the product, decarbonized product from India all the way to Korea. In the opposite direction, there could be a flow of technology uh, from Korea to India uh, for building the, the the green hydrogen and green ammonia projects, which would produce that product, which end up, ends up going to Korea. Korea has uh, expertise from an engineering perspective in multiple dimensions in this uh, business. You have electrolyzers, and there are many companies in Korean companies which are very well established in this field. In the field of hydrogen storage. Korea is as good as it gets anywhere in the world. They have a head start because they've been uh, working with fuel cells and fuel cell electric vehicles for a long while right now, much more so than most of the countries in, this, uh, in the world. And then beyond that, integrating all the different machinery together in a well-optimized engineering configuration, that is done by EPC companies. And there are quite a few Korean EPC companies who are amongst the world's best in this particular business, particularly the green hydrogen and green ammonia business.